Really beloved in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. It is an unquestionable fact of our holy faith that Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, has come to us through Mary. And this is so because it pleased God that it be so. It pleased the Heavenly Father that the Redeemer of mankind should be born of a woman. It has pleased Him that His eternal Son should be born in time of the Virgin Mary. It was His holy will that this man-woman combination should offset and counteract the harm done to mankind by another man-woman combination, that of Adam and Eve, who by their sin in the Garden of Eden caused the fall of man. It was the holy will of the Heavenly Father that Jesus and Mary should be united inseparably in the great act of the redemption of mankind, just as they were inseparably united from the moment of the Incarnation in Nazareth. (coughs) And so it is that Jesus and Mary are inseparably united also in our sanctification, so that we receive grace from Jesus through Mary, who has been constituted as the mediatrix and distributor of all graces. All through our earthly lives, as we take up our cross and follow the Divine Redeemer in obedience to His own command, we necessarily follow also in the footsteps of His sorrowful Mother. By the cross of Jesus on Calvary, we find also Mary, His Mother. As we enter by the narrow gate and walk the narrow way that leads to life, avoiding the wide gate and the broad way that leads to destruction, we enter that narrow gate and walk that narrow way of life in union with Jesus and Mary. It is always Jesus and Mary on the way to eternal salvation. We cannot have the one without the other. We cannot have the Son without the Mother, nor the Mother without the Son. We cannot have Jesus without Mary, nor can we have Mary without Jesus. This is so because of the divine arrangement of things. This is God's own chosen system of salvation for men. Because of the inseparability of Jesus and Mary in God's plan of salvation, There has been formulated that ancient and very well-known expression, to Jesus through Mary. This venerable principle of the spiritual life does not in any way imply that we may not, for example, address our Lord directly in prayer without mentioning His Mother. But even then we always have her as our model and teacher of prayer to God and we have her as our inspiration and guide and encouragement. To say that we go to Jesus through Mary, or to acknowledge that Jesus came to us through Mary, does by no means imply that God was incapable of making any other arrangement in this regard. It is hardly necessary to say that the Eternal Father could have given us His Son, Without a complete, uh, with a complete and perfect human nature, without the cooperation of any woman, if he had so wished. Likewise, if he had so wished, he could have excluded Mary from his plan of salvation for men. He could have, had he so wished, set up another system or law of grace, so that all graces would come to us directly from the divine Savior and not through the hands of Mary. But we are not concerned with what God could have done or might have done had it so pleased Him. We are concerned only with what He actually did choose to do. And He actually did choose to give us His Son through Mary. And He did choose to give us Mary as our guide to Jesus. And so we accept His decision and abide by His wishes when we go to Mary, that she may lead us to Jesus, her divine Son, who is the whole reason for her sublime greatness. 
Devotion to Mary means devotion to Jesus. And love of Mary means love of Jesus. And our giving of ourselves to Mary means giving ourselves to Jesus who lives in her. And so it is that consecration to Mary means also consecration to Jesus. The saints were no, not known for doing things by halves or by doing things half-heartedly in their love and service of God and of the Blessed Mother. One of the saints who was outstanding in his wholehearted devotion to Mary was St. Louis de Montfort, a French missionary priest who died in the early part of the 18th century and about whose life we shall have something more to say. For now we shall concentrate on his doctrine of total consecration to Mary, which he so zealously promoted in his brief priestly life and for which he is so well known. Total consecration, though it was not exclusively his idea, is almost identified with him, so that his name almost automatically comes to mind when total consecration is mentioned. The expression total consecration to Mary is more fully stated if we say total consecration to Jesus through Mary. In the actual words of St. Louis de Montfort himself, it is consecration to Jesus Christ, the incarnate wisdom, through the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the consecration, in the teaching of St. Louis de Montfort, this consecration to Mary and to Jesus through Mary means giving ourselves to Mary as her servants, or to use the stronger term, as her slaves. This is a kind of holy slavery of love that is totally unlike the degrading kind of slavery in which human beings are made subject to other human beings for unholy, worldly purposes. The holy slavery of love has a strictly heavenly purpose, which elevates and ennobles those who give themselves as slaves to Mary and to Jesus through Mary. As St. Louis de Montfort himself declares, the devotion <laughs> of total consecration and of holy slavery, which he promoted so fervently among the people of 18th century France, was not something new. In fact, he admitted that this devotion is so ancient that we cannot fix precisely the date of its beginnings. It is certain, however, that for more than 700 years we find traces of it in the Church. Research since the time of St. Louis Montfort has shown that this devotion does go back much farther than even the seven year, 700 years before his time. Some authors have maintained that St. Ephraim of Syria, a doctor of the church and one of the early fathers of the church, used the expression slave of the mother of God when speaking of himself, and that was in the fourth century. But at least as early as the 7th century, it was customary for a person to call himself or herself a slave of the Mother of God. St. Ildefons of Toledo in Spain in the 7th century wrote in a book on the perpetual virginity of Mary, I desire to be a slave of the Mother of God. How much I desire to be a slave of that lady. Other fathers of the church and other saints also made use of that title, Slave of the Mother of God. Among these were St. John the Damascene of the 8th century, and St. Anselm of Canterbury and St. Bernard of Clairvaux, both of the 12th century, and both of them intensely devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The expression, Slave of the Mother of God, was found on official ecclesiastical seals used in the 5th and 6th centuries in northern Africa where the church was strong in those days. 
and produced such great saints as St. Augustine and St. Cyprian. Among the popes who applied that title to themselves were Pope John VII of the 8th century, Pope Nicholas IV of the 13th century, and Pope Paul V in the 17th century. The title was customary in Catholic Ireland at least as early as the 9th century. To all these facts discovered through painstaking research, we must add the fact that one of the religious orders is officially known by the title of Servants of Mary, more commonly called simply Servites. This religious order was established in the 13th century by the seven Servite founders. Though in English these religious are not officially called Slave of Mary, but rather Servants of Mary, the Latin word is the same in either case. The Latin word Servus means either slave or servant in English. We should also mention that Thomas a Kempis, so well known for his incomparable imitation of Christ or following of Christ, made extensive use of the title Slave of Mary or Slave of the Mother of God. He is not so well known for his imitation of Mary in which that title is found. Kempis died in 1471. Though the expression Slave of Mary and its variations was used for so many centuries it was not until the end of the 16th century that an organization was formed in which the members called themselves Slaves of Mary. It was a confraternity of holy slavery founded in Spain by a Franciscan sister of the Immaculate Conception, Sister Mary Agnes of St. Paul. More such confraternities using various titles were founded in the years that followed. Even the King of Spain, Philip III, and his wife, Queen Margaret, belonged to such a confraternity. And with them also various other important persons of both church and state. From Spain, confraternities of holy slavery to Mary spread into Belgium, which was subject to Spain at one time, and to Holland, and then they spread into Poland through Prince Ladislaus IV, who heard a sermon on holy slavery to Mary while on a visit to Belgium. And then the idea spread into other countries as well. At first, however, the doctrine of holy slavery and consecration to Mary was not as clear-cut and as well-developed as it became later on through the teachings of St. Louis de Montfort. The consecration was not addressed to Jesus, the incarnate w wisdom, and it did not stress the filial dependence of Jesus upon his Holy Mother as was done by St. Louis de Montfort. But the development of the idea of total consecration and of holy slavery did take place during the early part of the 17th century in which St. Louis de Montfort was born. It gradually developed in the French school of spirituality, and it was really from this school that St. Louis received his knowledge of total consecration and total abandonment to the Mother of God. Among those who adopted the practice of total consecration and holy slavery was St. John Eudes, who died while St. Louis de Montfort was still just a little boy. St. John Eudes was the great apostle of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Both St. John Eudes and St. Louis de Montfort centered everything around Jesus and Mary. Before St. Louis de Montfort began preaching his own version of total consecration and holy slavery, the devotion was widespread in Catholic Europe of the 17th century. This devotion had been approved and indulgent by various popes, and it was being propagated by many religious orders, 
including the Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, Benedictines, Augustinians, and others, before St. Louis appeared on the scene. It is true that the popes were eventually forced to condemn the abuses that crept in in connection with the devotion of total consecration and holy slavery, such as the wrong use of little chains, and they even went so far as to abolish certain confraternities in which such abuses were rampant, but they never condemned the devotion as such. As St. Louis de Montfort himself once remarked, we cannot see how the devotion could be condemned without overturning the foundations of Christianity. By this he meant that the devotion of total consecration, properly understood and practiced, is solidly based upon our holy faith, and it is actually a full and total living of the faith with whole heart and soul. St. Louis de Montfort developed his doctrine of total consecration and holy slavery to Jesus and Mary during the comparatively few years of his priesthood. He was ordained a priest of God in 1700, and he died in 1716. But the work of preaching that he did during these 16 years, and especially the last 10 years or so of his life, was enough to fill more than one lifetime of an ordinary priest. His work as a priest was that of preaching especially parish missions, and that is why he is called a missionary priest, though he did at one time desire to be a foreign missionary also. He preached mainly for the poor and the simple people, who did not have any kind of special education in the schools. And in fact, many of them did not even have what we would consider an adequate education. St. Louis came to them to educate them in the holy faith and to teach them to live by the holy faith, heart and soul. As the saint did this, not only through preaching parish missions, but also through his numerous writings, not all of which uh, have appeared in English, the most important work of St. Louis de Montfort is the well-known treatise on the true devotion of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which develops in detail his doctrine of total consecration and holy slavery. The title that this work bears was not given to it by St. Louis himself, who really did not give it any title at all. The saint completed the manuscript for his work of true devotion to Mary during his brief priestly career, but he did not publish it. He signed his name to it all right, but did not give it any title. He himself predicted that raging beasts, and by raging beasts he meant the enemies of God, that raging beasts would come in fury to tear with their diabolical teeth his little writing, or at least to smother it in the silence of a coffer. His prophecy about the coffer was literally fulfilled, for his treatise on true devotion of, uh, to Mary remained hidden away in some old trunk or box for 126 years after his death, believe it or not. It was only in 1842 that it was found in one of the houses of the fathers of the Company of Mary, which is the name of the religious con congregation that St. Louis de Montfort himself founded, and which is more popularly known today simply as the Montfort Fathers. He also founded a congregation for sisters called the Daughters of Wisdom, in honor of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal wisdom of God. The first publishers of St. Louis de Montfort's work on devotion to Mary are the ones who, in 1842 or later, gave it the title, Treatise on the True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. As the Montfort Fathers themselves have an occasion pointed out, <laughs> this title is a bit misleading because it 
seems to imply that there is no other kind of true devotion to Mary than that taught by St. Louis de Montfort. And of course, this is not correct, since there are various forms of genuine devotion to Mary. However, it is a fact that the saint considered his type of devotion to Mary to excel all other forms of devotion to her. Thus he wrote that having read nearly all the books which profess to treat of devotion to Our Lady, and having conversed familiarly with the best and wisest men in these latter times, I have never known or heard of any practice of devotion toward her at all equal to the one which I now wish to unfold. This strong statement of the saint is to be found in his treatise on true devotion to Mary. The saint immediately gives the reasons why he has such a high regard for his own particular type of devotion to Mary. He declares that it demands from the soul more sacrifices for God, emptying the soul more of itself and of its self-love, keeping it more faithfully in grace and grace more faithfully in it, uniting it more perfectly and more easily to Jesus Christ. To this he adds that his doctrine of devotion to Mary is more glorious to God, more sanctifying to the soul, and more useful to our neighbor than any other devotion to her. St. Louis de Montfort bases his doctrine of total consecration upon the fact that Mary is so closely united with Jesus in the redemption of mankind. He acknowledges that God, strictly speaking, did not need Mary, and he, being almighty, could have done everything without her had he so wished. But it was his holy will to do everything through her, with her consent to the Incarnation being the key to everything that he has done since that great moment. As St. Louis himself says, that great Lord, always independent and sufficient unto himself, never had nor has now any absolute need of the Blessed Virgin. Nevertheless, having willed to commence and to complete his great works by the most Blessed Virgin ever since he created her, we may well think that he will not change his conduct in the eternal ages. Because of God's will, the saint goes on to say, Our Lady is the inseparable companion of our Lord's life, of his death, of his glory, and of his power in heaven and upon earth. This inseparable union between Jesus and Mary began at the Incarnation, when Mary, because of her free consent to God's will, became the mother of Jesus, the Son of God. At that same moment also, she became the spiritual mother of men, who were destined to become members of the mystical body of Christ. Jesus was born physically of the Immaculate Virgin Mother, while all his followers were born of her mystically and spiritually. In conceiving the Divine Word physically in her Immaculate Body, the chaste Virgin, by that very fact, spiritually conceived all who were to become one with Him in His mystical body. For she conceived not only the head of the mystical body, but also the members of the mystical body. The St. Louis expresses it, that Jesus Christ, the head of men is born of her. The members of this head must also be born of her by a necessary consequence. The head and the members are born of the same mother. From this we can easily see that Mary's divine motherhood, together with her spiritual motherhood of men, forms the basis for the total consecration to Jesus through Mary, 
whereby we become slaves of Jesus and Mary. The saint often signed his letters with Louis Marie de Montfort, the unworthy slave of Jesus and Mary. The French name Marie, which means uh, Mary in English, was the name he chose for himself as his confirmation name. Though among the French, there has been a long-standing custom of many parents giving the name Mary or Marie to a child already at baptism as a sign of consecrating or dedicating the infant to Mary from baptism on. The title of one of the many hymns which St. Louis de Montfort composed for the people to sing was entitled The Devout Slave of Jesus and Mary. The spiritual motherhood of men which began at the Incarnation was manifested openly on Calvary as Jesus hung upon the cross. There men were made to know the fact that Mary the mother of the crucified divine son was also their mother, their spiritual mother. As the mother of men, Mary united herself to Jesus on the cross in offering the great sacrifice by which men, her children, were redeemed and whereby they could be saved, provided that they make use of the graces of the redemption. In Les de Montfort shows how closely the hearts of Jesus and Mary were united in the Incarnation and Redemption. Their hearts, he says, united by strong and close ties, are offered both together to be victims to hold back the chastisement which our crimes merit. Here again we see the reason why men should be totally consecrated to Jesus and Mary because of the great blessings that have been given them through the united work of these two hearts. The saint also stresses the dependence, that is, the voluntary, freely chosen dependence of Jesus upon Mary. Even though in himself, as the infinite God, he is totally independent of any creature. St. Louis words it this way, Jesus glorified his independence and his majesty in depending upon this admirable virgin in his conception, in his birth, and in his presentation in the temple, in his hidden life of thirty years up to his death, where she had to assist in order that he make her, uh, make with her but one and the same sacrifice, and in order to be immolated by her consent to the Eternal Father. This makes it clear that we belong not only to Jesus, but also to Mary as a result of the redemption. She has redeemed us with Christ, and hence she too has acquired rights over the entire human race. And St. Louis states it, she has a right and a dominion over souls by a singular grace of the Most High. Mary is truly the mother as well as the mistress of men. In her dominion and power and authority over men, acquired through her cooperation in the Incarnation and Redemption, makes her also their queen. As the saint was fond of expressing it, Mary is the queen of all hearts. From all these facts we can clearly see that we belong totally to both Jesus and Mary because of what they have done inseparably united for our salvation. Therefore, total consecration to them must follow as a logical consequence and because Jesus became incarnate through the free consent of the Virgin Mary in Nazareth, and then 33 years later redeemed us through the free consent of his mother to the great sacrifice of Calvary, it is only fitting 
that the total consecration be made to Jesus through Mary. Mary's consent was total, from Nazareth to Calvary. And so it was that Jesus freely chose to be dependent upon Mary from Nazareth to Calvary. And so then, in our total consecration, Jesus is again, in a way, dependent on Mary. In Louis de Montfort, total consecration is the recognition of Mary's total motherhood over men and her total dominion over the souls of men whose mistress and queen she is. In his formula of consecration, the saint brings this out clearly when he says, In the presence of the heavenly court, I choose thee this day for my mother and mistress. I deliver and consecrate to thee as thy slave, my body and soul, my goods, both interior and exterior, and even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to thee the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me, without exception, according to thy good pleasure, for the greater glory of God in time and in eternity. These words are in that part of the act of consecration which is addressed to Mary. The first part of this act of consecration is addressed to Jesus as the eternal and incarnate wisdom. The full official title of this act of consecration is called Consecration of Ourselves to Jesus Christ, the Incarnate Wisdom, by the Hands of Mary. The words which we have quoted and which are addressed to Mary show clearly why the consecration is called a total consecration. There can be no doubt that our consecration to Jesus should be a total consecration, but the significant thing about St. Louis's total consecration is that we give and consecrate ourselves totally and completely also to Mary. The basic reason for this is, as we have already explained, that Mary is our spiritual mother and our mistress and our queen, and that she was totally and inseparably united with Jesus in the entire mysteries of the Incarnation and the Redemption. The inseparability of Jesus and Mary in the work of all our salvation is such that in consecrating ourselves to one of them, we must necessarily consecrate ourselves also to the other. We cannot give ourselves to the one and not to the other. We cannot have one without the other. In explaining the meaning of consecrating our interior and spiritual goods, St. Louis de Montfort explains that in this consecration we give to Mary all the satisfactory value of our good deeds. This means that our good actions satisfy or atone, at least in part, for our sins, and thus diminish the length of our possible stay in purgatory after death. In other words, by our good works, we atone to God or make reparation to him for our sins. But the fact is that we can satisfy or atone also for the sins of others. And so it is that by our total consecration to Mary, we place all our acts of satisfaction or atonement or reparation into Mary's hands, giving her full freedom to apply them and communicate them to others. And this is precisely what is done by the heroic act of charity, whereby, whereby we give up totally all acts of satisfaction that may benefit us personally, offering them to God entirely for others. And this means even giving up what may be done for us after our death, such as people having holy masses offered for us after our death. 
But there is no doubt that God will richly reward such a heroic act of charity. St. Louis de Montfort himself does not, however, go quite so far in his total consecration as does the heroic act of charity. St. Louis also explains that our good deeds have what is called an impetratory value. And uh, by this is meant that our good deeds are equivalent to a prayer of petition, so that without us having to ask expressly, God will grant us graces and blessings simply because of our good deeds. Though this does not in exclude the necessity of also asking God for uh, graces expressly. The word impetration is nothing but a complicated word for petition or prayer of petition. So our good deeds are said to have an impetratory value and characteristic. St. Louis explains further that our good actions have a meritorious value, as we easily understand. But in giving everything to Mary, in the act of total consecration, she does not apply our merits to somebody else because our merits, as well as our graces and virtues, are our own and cannot be communicated to others. But we do give her our merits and blessings and virtues so that she may keep them and increase them and beautify them for us. And in this way, she makes them more pleasing and more acceptable to Jesus. We might say that she turns everything into gold for Jesus. And she, so to speak, fixes up everything so as to make it more beautiful in the eyes of her divine Son. And that is the advantage of having everything go through the immaculate hands of Mary. Another distinctive thing about St. Louis de Montfort's total consecration is the fact that this consecration is a perfect renewal of the vows and promises of holy baptism, <coughs> as he himself expresses it. And in fact, through this consecration, we do what we did not do at baptism. That is, we now speak for ourselves, and not merely through our sponsors. And we now give ourselves to Jesus through the hands of Mary, which we did not do at baptism, at least not expressly and explicitly. And we now give to Jesus through the hands of Mary even the very value of all our good actions. St. Louis de Martin warns that it is not enough merely to recite the act of consecration with the lips, but as he says, it is necessary to enter into its spirit. He declares that it is not enough to have given ourselves once as slaves to Jesus through Mary. It is not very difficult to enroll ourselves in a confraternity, nor to practice this devotion insofar as it prescribes a few vocal prayers every day. But the great difficulty is, as the saint says, to enter into its spirit. And now his spirit consists in this, that we be interiorly dependent upon Mary. In other words, we must live by what we say and do uh, what we say and do in the act of total consecration. The St. Louis de Montfort explains this interior spirit of total consecration to Mary means that we must do all our actions through Mary with Mary, in Mary, and for Mary, so that we may do them all the more perfectly through Jesus, with Jesus, in Jesus, and for Jesus. Because of the great importance of the total consecration to Jesus through Mary, whereby we become slaves of Jesus and Mary, St. Louis de Montfort has arranged a period of 33 days preparation before the act of consecration is made. Thus, 
one can choose some feast of Jesus or Mary, or Mary, or Mary, on which he wishes to make the act of total consecration, but he should prepare himself through various prayers and exercises for a period of 33 days before the day chosen for the consecration. A detailed program of preparation is given in the supplement found in the Treatise on True Devotion, and it is also published in a separate booklet, which uh, makes it even easier to follow the progress day by day. This same period of 33 days preparation can be repeated every year before the anniversary of the total consecration, although this is not strictly prescribed. The value of such a yearly renewal should be obvious to anyone. We have already made a brief reference to the fact that the devotion of holy slavery to Jesus and Mary was approved by many popes before the time of St. Louis de Montfort. But we wish to mention now, uh, before concluding, that St. Louis's own system of holy slavery and total consecration has been specifically approved by various popes since his work on true devotion was discovered in 1842 and it was officially declared to be free of all error in 1853. In fact, Pope St. Pius X openly acknowledged that he used de Montfort's true devotion as his guide in writing his encyclical Ad Diem Illum for the Golden Jubilee of the Dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1904. Pope Pius XII, who canonized St. Louis de Montfort in 1947 and who had a great love for him, declared at the canonization that St. Louis de Montfort is the guide who leads you to Mary and from Mary to Jesus. May the Lord bless you and give you peace.